Welcome to the Wellcast. The world has a lot to say. We're bringing a biblical perspective to those conversations. Welcome back, friends and family, to another episode of the Wellcast. I am Jordan Hogue, and today is a big day because I get to introduce you guys to our new co-host, the Melissa Denisi. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Welcome to the Wellcast, Thank Melissa. You. Thank you. Melissa, you are, you know, you have you wear many hats. You are a person of many you you're very you have many lives. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know, as we thought through, hey, Mike's leaving, what comes next? Um, there was a couple of things for me that felt like I want to talk to Melissa first. And it was one, hey, pretty practically, it'd be nice to have a female voice. I am that. Consistently yes. on this. So congrats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on being that. And uh, I thought I was going to have to like sell you pretty hard. And so I remember I called you and I was like, hey, here's here's what it is. No, I thought there was a serious thing you had to tell me. like. And you were just like, oh, that sounds fun. Let's do it. <laughs> yep. So thank you for being an easy yes. ask. Yep. I appreciate happy, it. First phone check. call, first yes. I love it. Um, yeah, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really am happy to be here. Why did you say yes? Um, well, I have a lot of fun with you. Um, we are friends. We are friends. Yes. I think you're a great pastor, a deep thinker. I like to talk about things with you, but also I kind of feel like, hey, Lord, if this is something that will encourage people in our church in a different way and it works with my season of life, then I say yes. I love that. um, Yep. So that's what it was. We were just talking about where we became friends. Mm -hmm. Um, Jamie and I went on a trip to Israel (laughs) with you and Santino in the summer of 2012. Yep. And like, what do you remember about that trip? I remember you and Santino Uh being the class clowns. It felt like (laughs) very funny. You guys, your sense of humor, all of it was just, uh, it was so fun to be there together. You know, everyone on like a, basically a tour around this area, you end up just sitting in the same place all the time. Yep. And you guys were right in front of us. Every time? Uh-huh. Yeah. And we were just nacho libre quotes. Oh, yeah. And constantly yep. joking. I was yep. like, this guy seems way more responsible than me. But for some reason, he has He's the same funny. humor that I am. Yeah. He's seriously <laughs> yeah. funny. Um, yeah. Likewise, I think one of the things I was super excited is you are a theologian. You're a deep thinker. You're a person of uh, like great shepherding and pastoring abilities and you lead our uh well we'll get into what you do but i think um i have a lot of respect for you the way you think and so i was excited like how our brains could come together Mm -hmm. um one quick thing fun could be disastrous it's true (laughs) do you uh do you remember one particular thing that happened on the bus that i said when you were asking, <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. remember his name. <laughs> Sam the, Meyer. the smartest man that we've ever yeah. known. Dr. In the Sam world. Meyer yes. came on this trip, yes. blessed us with his. He was a professor of ancient Near Eastern languages at Ohio State. And you were trying so hard oh. to be his friend and so to hard. just get to know him yeah. and be smart. And the question out of your mouth to him was Do you like, hey, so um, where, Sam. I asked him where he lives. <laughs> Where do you, okay, where you tell it, you tell it then. <laughs> I said, where do you live? And he's like, oh, yeah, I live, you know, next to Ohio State University where I work. And <laughs> the next question was, does your wife live there with you? <laughs> and he was like, he was yeah. so kind. He was so nice. He just smiled and kind of looked at me and was like, okay, so this is a real question. And he's like, yeah, she does. <laughs> she does live with me. <laughs> oh, and I were being like, oh, and no. everyone who heard that was yeah. like, Jordan, <laughs> you guys destroyed me. You guys did not let me live it down. Oh, oh yes, that was a fun trip. Phil Belmont was on that trip with us yep. too. That was a fun little crew. The Holmeses, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Man. Oh my gosh, that was fun. It was so fun. I got horrible heat rash all up my legs and I just wore Crocs the whole time. I do remember crying on that hike that day. We were in the desert, remember? It was Masada. like over 120. I didn't do Masada. Oh. But we had like three hikes that day and the last one we got to the top and I think I think I threw a rock across the <laughs> desert because it was like, what are we doing out here? This is so you really hot. You experienced this the deep so desert. Miserable. Yeah. <laughs> Like, wow, David, you had it really bad. The yeah. Israelites had yeah. it bad. Yeah. It's really hot there. Uh, well, okay. Well, let's get into it. Okay. I thought We thought that this first episode would be a great introduction. You guys have heard from Melissa and parts of her journey. You were on our episode about um, wrestling with grief and infertility. Mm-hmm. So we're, uh, yeah, so let's get to know you. Okay. Um, what is your role at the well right now? Right now, yeah. my role at the well, I am the women's Bible study director and the life group director. Okay. So I have two director roles that really kind of blend together. So the last five or six years, I've been leading the women's Bible study at the well. So that's writing, teaching, raising up leaders. And last summer, about a year ago, um, was asked to expand my role and become the life group director mm. and, and use some of those things that we've learned through women's Bible study to help our life group ministry. And yeah. I said yes to that, not because I was bored or mm-hmm. uh, was looking for more hours, but because I really love the local church and I love people to get in smaller pockets and open the word and grow together. So yeah. that's what I do here. Well, you say you're not bored because you do have a full life already. I Yes, I do. Tell us about your family. Um, I have. I'm married to Santino. We've been married for 17 years now. Uh-huh. Which that feels weird. Um, weird to say. Santino. And he has a very. The man. Yeah. He's the man. Yeah. Yeah. Love that, that guy. I'm married to. Um, the Italian stallion. Yeah. His name in Italian means little saint. Oh, that nice. That's perfect for him. He is a smaller guy. Yeah. And he's very saintly. He's that's great. Um, but he has a very, um, he's the controller of the city of Fresno. So he's got a full job. Um, that's very stressful. He allocates a lot of our money. Yeah. Yes. yes. He's in charge of all the money in the city of Can Fresno. Can you tell him to just keep building that zoo? Keep building the zoo. Okay. Yeah. Let me put that on my notes yeah. and I'll bring that up. It's so great. Night. <laughs> um, and then I have a five-year-old son, Mateo. And a four-year-old daughter, Francesca, we call her Frankie. Frankie. So they keep me very busy. I love being with them, love being home with them. Um, Rowan, my son Rowan loves your kids. And my kids love your kids. Frankie sometimes needs to put him in his place, and she does. (laughs) She kind of puts everyone in their place. She puts everyone in their place. Mm -hmm. Um, She's very justice-oriented. She really is. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I am not bored, because (laughs) I have plenty of discipleship to do at home. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that's that's my home life, too. So Well, um, what do you do for fun? Oh, boy. (laughs) Do you have, like, hey, we love to go out to a restaurant, I do love going out to a restaurant, Mm -hmm. either just the two of us. I really do love going as a family, but Santino hates it. (laughs) He only does that because I like to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is so hard with little kids. Even even four and five is easier than like two and three. When they don't, what do they care about eating the food? They just want to get in everybody else's business. Mm -hmm. They're... But I love to do that. I do love to go to restaurants. Um, I'm a quality time person. So when I think of fun, it's just anything that right now we're swimming almost every day somewhere. If you have a pool, please invite me over. We'll love to (laughs) swim in your pool. Mm -hmm. Um, But time with my family like that for fun. I used to read for fun, but I don't read anymore. People tell me someday I will again. I do read. I should say that, but not the way I used to. You know how to read. I know how to read. Yeah. Um, I and you went read. to seminary. I did. Go to <laughs> so <read>. Hopefully, <laughs> you have to read in yeah. seminary. Um, that's. I'm pretty. I don't know. My life is just so. Uh, if you like to go out to eat, where do you want to go? If it's with the kids, we almost always go to Eureka Burger. It's a good choice. And um, which is funny, it's a burger place, but I'd love to get the nachos there. Yeah, have I mean they the have awesome food. There? Yeah. It's like a fancy burger place. But if it's just Santino and I going out, we love Annex. Mm-hmm. That's like fancy going out to dinner place. Yeah. So, which All we, right. yeah. I like that. Yeah. We receive gift cards to both of those places too. Since your husband's so Italian, like, is Italian food you don't eat out at Italian? Unless it's Annex. 
Okay. Oh, okay. So that's a plug for because Annex. Because Annex is, they're, uh, they're unique okay. and you always get, it's so uh, consistent. You're always going to get a good meal and he loves to try different things. So I'm not a foodie person, mm-hmm. but he tried the squid ink pasta. Oh. So like stuff, he, yeah. if he's going out to Italian food, he's not getting spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> he's getting those kind of unique things and Annex always has stuff like that. Well, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing us a little bit. Yeah. Of, you know, your life. Yes. A snapshot. That's what we do for fun. Tell us. Dinner. I'd say, <laughs> what's your like? We got pieces of your story in the past, but give us sort of your abbreviated Jesus story. Okay. What's your God story? Okay. How did you? <laughs> what's your testimony? What's my testimony? Mm-hmm. Um, I did not grow up in the church. I grew up in a really fun, loving family. We didn't go to church. And I can remember in elementary school asking my dad, what are we? Because I had friends that were Jehovah's <laughs> Witness People. or Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, we're Christian. You know, kind of like we're American. We're Christian. Mm-hmm. That's what we are. And I went, oh, OK. What does that mean? I don't know. But just I needed to know. So on the playground, I could tell people, yeah. well, we're Christian. We're not Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, so there was no hostility towards God or like anti God in my family. It was just we didn't we didn't go to church. It wasn't a part of our life. Um, and then uh, in high school we moved. So I used to I grew up in Stockton. We moved to Fresno, and that was a culture shock for me. Fresno was very different from, I should say, I went to to Clovis School, so it was very different from where I was coming from. Mm-hmm. And you're adjusting your whole life. You know, I'm a sophomore in high school. Now I'm making new friends and new friend group and all of that. But Mm -hmm. um, stayed here for college, Fresno State. And uh, my third year of college, my dad died suddenly of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And my dad was probably my closest friend. So I had a very good relationship with my dad. Um, He was fun. We'd talk about politics or serious things. And we'd watch Seinfeld together, you know, just... Um, And so when he died, it really shook me to the core of like those questions about life. What Mm. happens after you die? Who's in charge of your time on earth? Um, People, people would tell me all the time, Jesus died on the cross for you. And I would think, what does that even mean? mean? You know, the irony now of me saying, uh, what does his death on the cross have to do with my life? I just Mm -hmm. didn't understand that. I didn't have any hard feelings towards it. It just didn't make any sense to me. So that sort of opened up this journey of, okay, this life on earth is not all we have. So then what? There has to be a truth out there. I knew from the beginning it wasn't like, well, everybody can believe whatever they want and Mm -hmm. it's all good. I thought, what is the one true way and how do we know? Um, And I didn't really have a lot of people in my life who could answer those questions. I had a lot of people who told me, believe in Jesus or you can go to church once in a while and you're fine. Mm-hmm. A lot of my friends at the time were nominally Catholic. And so it was like, well, you don't have to like, you can just kind of believe in something and you're good. Yeah. And I remember thinking, no, there's, there's more to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but nobody around me to ask. And at the time I was, you know, living the way your life would go if you're not a Christian or maybe <laughs> you are, but in college um, partying, you know, practically living with my boyfriend And I remember kind of going right back into that life and yet still wanting to know truth. And so around that time, um, I drove up next to my former high school boyfriend on on the road. So about a year after (laughs) my dad died. Okay. And we rolled down the window. Hey, let's go catch up. He knew my dad. He was at our house every day for a few years um, close to my dad. And we, we go to lunch to catch up. And at lunch, he gets real serious and tells me, you know, I'm sorry. I heard about what happened with your dad. I loved him. Um, And also, I want to say I'm sorry for how I treated you when we were together in high school. And Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this guy across from me going, you are so different. Something has happened. It was he was so humble at whatever, 21 years old, 22 years old and um, just real sincere. Basically, he's making amends to me. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I don't know that. If, I don't know the language for that, right? And I realized in that moment, I finally have a person that I can ask questions about God because he tells me I've come to know the Lord since we've been broken up in college. He got involved in a college group, placed his faith in Christ, and he said the Lord had put on his heart if he ever were to see me again to apologize for how things were. And a few weeks later, we drove up next to each other on the side of the road. Oh, and wow. so he's he's telling me he's sorry and he's a Christian. And my heart has been searching for someone 
to disciple me, basically. Yeah. Um, side note, this is not an advertisement for missionary dating or whatever yeah. that's yeah. called, but I had somebody, someone I trusted, someone who knew my family that I could ask questions to, and I did. Um, meanwhile, I'm still smoking, I'm still drinking, I'm still living crazy, but my heart is turned toward the Lord. So I'm asking, how do you know, what about Jesus? Everybody tells me about Jesus. We watch Passion of the Christ. <laughs> I'm like, who are these mean guys in those outfits to Jesus? And pausing it, answering questions. I tell people Mel Gibson was <laughs> instrumental in my conversion, but All it right. was. that I know, yeah. okay? God can use anything. But it was in that movie when the scene where... Um, they're dragging that woman who's caught in adultery out into the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, according to law, then if you're caught, death was the punishment. That was the penalty. That was by law. She should have been stoned to death. And Jesus stands in front of her to say, not her. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get this one. She's mine. And it was sort of that moment of the scales fell from my eyes that my sin should have earned me death. And in my place, Jesus stands in front of me to say, not her. This mm. one's mine. So then it was, um, I read Case for Christ because I wanted to know more about the historicity of Jesus, the accuracy. And I came to a place where I realized, okay, I knew the truth now. There was enough evidence there that Jesus really is who he says he is. Mm-hmm. He is the son of God, the savior. So either I live like this is true or I live knowing it's true and live how I want which is essentially rejecting it. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the moment of like, okay, this is real and I need to now live like it's real. Uh, Started going to the well. They were teaching through Revelation. So super easy. (laughs) New believer. Great introductory content, yeah. (laughs) Um, But that was it. That was my journey of um, I needed people around me. I got plugged into a life group at the well and I remember going to those first few life groups saying, I just need you guys to ask, did I get drunk yesterday or how many times I did last week because Mm -hmm. I really want to walk this out um, and I don't don't know how to do it with this past life of mine. Um, And I'm sure they were like, whoa, what is this, you know, who is this person? So yeah. Um, that was my my faith journey into, yeah, understanding who Jesus was, him using suffering to bring about those questions and then people to help walk me through. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, um, like sometimes those very, I would say, existential moments mm-hmm. of, you know, you're a young person and you maybe never even looked death in the eye and then it happens to you mm-hmm. and you have start to ask big questions Yep. and seemingly one of the worst things that's ever happened to you ends up sort of breeding the best Mm -hmm. thing that could ever Mm -hmm. happen to you. Yeah. I mean, I would say I lost an earthly father, but gained a heavenly father. That Mm -hmm. was kind of what I, how I described that experience um, in those early days of understanding. And I think those are questions we probably all have, but until you're really forced to wrestle them out yeah, um, it's profoundly easy to sort of ignore and distract mm-hmm. uh, your life away yeah. until you're forced, your hand is forced at some point Yeah, to answer. Yeah. yeah. And whether you care or not, I mean, at some point you're going to have to ask them. Yeah. That's, yeah, I <laughs> a grace, a hidden grace from God probably, mm-hmm. but it's, yeah, that's, uh, that's powerful. Do you, um, so you have Melissa who's young in the faith, getting mm-hmm. plugged into community, mm-hmm getting into the life of the church for the first time to now Melissa leading ministry, having Mm -hmm. gone to seminary, loves the Bible, teaching the Bible. Like, you know, I know you went to school to be a teacher Mm -hmm. and then at some point transitioned into ministry. Tell me about that. Yeah. You know, um, before I do, sometimes I, I tell this story often, my testimony that I forget to say that boyfriend of mine that I drove up next to on the side of the road is now, my husband that was the same thing okay so there you go (laughs) we did get married however he in the beginning was like I'm not dating her I Mm -hmm. mean look at what I was doing but yes we did get married and in that time I was going to school to be a teacher so I finished up my credential program and I started my first year of teaching we moved to the Bay Area the first couple years of our marriage and I started teaching (laughs) kindergarten Um, which I loved until I taught a different grade and realized, wow, kindergarten's really hard. Those kids (laughs) are. (laughs) 
You're like teaching numbers to squirrels. <laughs> oh my goodness. What was I even teaching them? Who knows? But yeah. um because on paper my whole life I I knew I was meant to be a teacher. And so I was in the public school for a long time teaching. I think I was I taught I taught kindergarten, first grade, third grade. So that was five years of teaching. And as I each year that went by, it kept feeling like a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. You know that saying, whatever mm -hmm. I said it wrong. You did it. You know, okay, yeah. that's the right one. Where there were parts of it that I loved. Um, I loved being in the public school. I loved being around the kids, but there was just something not quite the right fit. Yeah. And um, I had a similar experience because I was, I'd always been in teaching roles and like I was working for Apple in their oh. store. And like I started in sales and then I was like, can I just like teach? I don't want to do sales. Can I just teach people how to use this stuff? And then eventually I was like teaching the technology yeah. and like, yeah, I had a similar yeah. thing where I have a heart for that. Yes. That expression. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. So anyways. But I found myself in teaching. Now at the time I was leading a life group at the well. And so this is years have gone mm -hmm. by. Right. Uh, and and the prayer team. And um, the prayer team was sort of like a little, every week I'd write like a very short little devotional something that I'd send out to our prayer team member. My my closest friends in the church were all, you know, old ladies that we <laughs> meet together. The prayer pray. team, yeah. <laughs> and then life group. But I found myself as I was teaching, really thinking about the women in our church a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, during recess, I'm texting, you want to grab coffee? Or, and it was always um, very like care and discipleship oriented. So just wanting to reach out to women in our church. And through this time, the state went through a horrible budget crisis. And uh, Santino actually was the budget director of Fresno Unified. Mm -hmm. Teachers from a certain date on all got, um, what is it called? Laid off. Pink letters or whatever. What is that yeah. called? Pink slip. Pink slip. Pink letters. Layoff letters. <laughs> I got laid off, signed by my husband and Fresno Unified <laughs> budget director. But in that, it was like, oh, my gosh, this is this is it. Now I can. And shortly after that, I got a call from one of our campus pastors that said, what would you, would you want to come on part time and help shepherd leaders in our church, women in our church, sort of like his counterpart. We called it spiritual formation shepherd at the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. Yes. So I did. That's how I got into part time ministry. And because it was only part time, I was able to go back into the school's part time reading teacher. So oh, now okay. I'm doing both things. I'm doing reading, teaching part time, part time ministry. And yet still, even in part time reading teaching, I'm flipping flashcards to kids thinking about our church, thinking about people in our church, thinking about this woman needs to connect with that woman because they share a similar story and mm -hmm. she's found healing um, and so I, I mean, at the time now looking back, that was the stir, the calling into full-time ministry and soon that door opened. So I came on staff full-time as a spiritual formation shepherd to our North campus. So life group leaders meeting with women in our church, um, which led into me realizing there's a lot of hurt and pain in our church that one woman mm -hmm. on staff could not adequately care for. Yeah. yeah. And so we needed to find a way to better care for people in our church. And I went to seminary to pursue pastoral care to women because mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know, how do I do this better and how do I build a team or something to do it better? But in the meantime, as I was in seminary, I took a class on writing Bible study and I started to see this value of pulling women together in our church um, for that, for care, really, and mm -hmm. to grow in their knowledge of the scripture. So um, on the side of this job that I had and seminary, I started to lead what's now women's Bible study. So it started from the living room and then it was, hey, can we just for the summer meet here at the Clovis campus to 500 plus women now going through books of the Bible, multi-generational around the table, um, sharing stories, connecting to God's word. And that that was my yeah, my role into ministry seminary, and then here I am now doing. Do you that feel again. like was it instantaneous, or was there any marked moments that you felt like God really started opening the scriptures to you? And you, because one of the things I think about you is like Melissa loves her Bible. Mm -hmm. She loves reading, teaching, and um, did you have a moment or a season where you felt like you kind of fell in love with that process? Man, from the beginning, it was hunger. 
I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know this God that I felt like I had missed out on for 20 years. So I wanted to know. And because I didn't grow up in the church, I didn't have any of this like baggage with who. I mean, I, you we all do, right? Because we all have false narratives of who God is or the church or whatever. But I didn't have. <laughs> you had the gift of an open or a blank slate. A blank slate. Yeah. So I read it in scripture and went, well, why don't we? do that if mm -hmm. that's what it says why mm -hmm. are there 20 denominations that teach it differently right so i was so naive ignorant in a in a good way of it started from a hunger of wanting to know god and then it was sort of like as i was telling people what i was learning um i watched light bulbs i didn't know i was mm -hmm. teaching the bible i was just telling them what i had learned or what i had mm -hmm. studied or what i Right. Because I thought teaching was you have a three point sermon and you stand on a stage and you have people in a room. Yeah, that's interesting. It, I had a friend who did something similar where I was processing my, like, I don't know, man, I'm ministry and I don't really fully know what my giftings are. And, you know, at that point, I had never given like a sermon or something yeah. like that. But he, he, he goes, Oh, well, teaching is one of your gifts, I think. And I was like, What the heck? Why? Why do you say that? Yeah. And he's like, you just, you learn something and you can't wait to tell all of us. Exactly. And yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. And he's like, and you're really good at explaining those things. Yeah. I was like, okay, maybe that does make me feel passionate. Yep. Yep. I had a similar experience. Yeah. So it was almost like a, um, as I was giving it away and I was seeing women start. Now I'm saying women because that was the context I was in. We led yeah. a co-ed life group for a little bit, so. Literally anyone who would listen to me actually was who I was <laughs> yeah. telling this stuff to. But that was what it kind of is like a, as my hunger grew, as I gave it away, I wanted yeah. to know more and I wanted others to know more. So it wasn't like a light bulb moment. I do remember a moment when I realized writing Bible studies might have been a unique uh, calling or gift because mm -hmm. I could, um, oh, I talked to other teachers I don't, I bet Mike never remembers telling me this, but he's like, I'd rather scratch my eyes out than ever sit down and write a Bible study. And I <laughs> remember going, really? I love it so much. And yeah. I can remember before a study setting out all my books on our kitchen counter and um, starting to cry because I felt the delight of the father. And I knew I was about to enter into a space with him that mm -hmm. felt so close. And that I remember recognizing that moment of like, I don't think everybody feels this mm -hmm. way about Bible study or writing a Bible study. You know, that yeah. was kind of a unique moment. Um, yeah, I'm probably similar to Mike in You'd rather poke Some your eyes ways. Open. I'm not that extreme because uh, <laughs> I do enjoy doing Bible study and things like that. But I think, uh, yeah, the we used to have to write uh, discussion guides based on our sermons oh, for yeah. life groups yeah. for students. Yeah. And every week I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, what are, and it was like four questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do I even, how do I yeah. even? And then I found this book by University Press that literally has discussion questions for every bible verse in the new testament great <laughs> and i was like that. oh thank you yeah. oh thank you or yeah. it was every like section you yeah. know and so that was very helpful but well, what keeps you i mean we heard about on ramping into ministry what keeps you in ministry um because as <laughs> as brad bell always says it's a uh, it's a terrible career but a beautiful calling <laughs> it is calling and i think that's such a i hate to use that word because i've seen people paralyzed by it like i gotta find my calling i gotta yeah, yeah. Um, Assignment. But you will know you're called into ministry when really hard things or hard seasons happen and you're still mm -hmm. um, wanting that. Yeah. You know, and so definitely calling because there's many times in motherhood, you know, when we adopted our first son, I thought, oh, this might be it when I when I'm done, I hang up my hat and I become a stay at home mom and I didn't feel released from it. And mm -hmm. it was a sloppy season of ministry for me. And it took a lot of people coming alongside to help, but I knew, okay, no, I'm now I'm supposed to do this steward what I have as a young mom who's sleep deprived. <laughs> and, you know, I can't think and remember things the way I could three yeah. months ago or whatever. Those loaves and fishes are small mm -hmm. <laughs> in that. Yeah, but he's I, got a multiple. Yeah, exactly. I think that, um, you know, over time to the joy, there is a joy in seeing people grow closer to the Lord. And actually, for me, it's been community. So getting to do ministry with um, a team of women 
that really actually probably for the last eight years has been pretty consistent off and on, but having community around me to speak into those moments when I'm like, I don't know if I could do mm-hmm. this or this is really hard or um, sharing the load keeps me in in ministry. Yeah, so I think the joy, the calling, um, I really do, I really have a love and a burden for the local church. And so mm-hmm. I think that's, the other well, thing. What, what gets you fired up about the church? What, you know, what are some, what gets you passionate or what are the issues? What are the things? Well, I think again, because of how I came into my relationship with God, I had this epiphany where I realized I was teaching women the Bible week after week, constantly thinking about how to best, let me help you understand who God is according to who he says he is, mm-hmm. right? Cause I saw freedom in that. I saw joy in that. Um, but I, I realized the reason I was so passionate about that was I was looking for that within friends, women, and nobody could really answer with substance the truth about why we believe the Bible or, mm-hmm. who, you know, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and so one of the things that keeps me fired up and in ministry is knowing that when we know God's word, we get to know him. So it's not just biblical literacy for the sake of knowing how to outline Romans. It's yeah. who God is from that, you know? So that's a huge passion of mine for our church is that people not just know their Bibles, but know the God of the Bible, enjoy time in his word. It's such a guilt ridden thing when you talk about Bible study and mm-hmm. you really can enjoy God through scriptures. He mm-hmm speaks to you. He guides you. He comforts you. The Bible doesn't just convict you. Okay. There's a lot of things that it yeah. does. It explains things about life. Um, every- I think I heard you frame, uh, frame that once as like, uh, you, you, your, one of your passions is that people would see scripture as like a gift mm-hmm. rather than a burden or something to do or they're, yeah. you know, that yeah. they would miss it rather than like be afraid that they're missing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's the closest you get to sitting down at coffee with Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. So you you want to know a friend deeper, you go to lunch, you play together, you do whatever, right? You spend time with that person. To me, that's what scripture is. So, yeah. But I know that is not the case for a lot of people or it's been you should read your Bible mm-hmm. instead of the God of the universe is inviting you into relationship with him through this word. Mm-hmm. And it's confusing and that's why you need other people around you to help you go, I don't know what that is means you know Mm -hmm. um so that is why i love the church um jesus loved the church she is a mess oh my gosh everyone is the worst in the (laughs) church we are messy us included us included especially you jordan yeah uh it's a mess it's a mess but why did he choose to use the church to be the thing to build his kingdom so Mm -hmm. to me it's like if i'm giving time to anything i want to give time to the thing that god thought was really important mm-hmm. on earth and so that's why i love the local church yeah um, well yeah. i i mean you guys are going to hear a lot about melissa and her views on things through this next season where we get to do this together and so uh yeah i'm excited melissa thanks Me for too. sharing a lot of your story and your passions with us um you have a ton of good things to say and so i'm really glad that i don't have to be the only person <laughs> to, i think everyone would be really disappointed if i was like Look, guys, I thought this podcast would be better just me talking alone in a yeah. room. And, uh, and so I would I'm, still listen to that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I we'll think see. I don't know if I would maintain a job because I think I would just end up down roads where nobody <laughs> knows. I'm like, Jordan, why are you talking about all this crazy <laughs> stuff? <laughs> and then uh, so I just I hope you guys um, are as excited as I am. And uh, so we'll see you guys next week. We're going to start a new series. Yep. Yep, and uh, I hope that you guys like, subscribe, and all the things. Share it with a friend. Leave us some comments. What do you want to hear <laughs> from us? Yeah. Let people know that, uh, you know, the we can't say the boys are back in town. What are we? The team? So Mike and I were the Boost Boys because we both had EcoBoost trucks. So we're going to have to think of a nickname, oh, for, uh, nick, nick tame, nickname for us. Yeah, that's going to take some time for me to think about. Okay. Well, we'll do that. You guys can give suggestions. We'll see you guys next time on The Wellcast. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this episode of The Wellcast. As always, don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about us. For more information about The Well Community Church, visit thewellcommunity.org.